Uh, this is our first uh, presentation for the semester for our center's show and tell. The purpose of the presentations is for faculty to share uh, innovations or things that they're trying out in the classroom with regards to language teaching, but these things are often um, applicable to any type of teaching. So um, through the encouragement of Ella that we have been inviting um, folks from other departments should they want to join today or should they want to um, look at the recording. Um, we're always thinking about, uh, like I said, our alumni. So we have a few of our alumni here from CLIC, alumni in the sense that they used to work here. I don't want to say like former colleagues because they're still our colleagues. Um, and so we're, we're very excited to see um, friends from other institutions that have worked with us in other settings joining us today. So myself and Miriam are going to start off the semester series and we're going to be talking about how to engage students and, um, and really how to have an impact on the way our students are um, participating in our classroom. And so I'm going to move you to my other monitor and I'm going to share my presentation with you. The way that we'll do it is I will present, Miriam will, will present and then we will open it up for about um, 15 minutes of Q and A. Um, and of course, if you have a question and you're like me and you forget it, you can always just type it in the chat and we can get back to it during the Q and A because this happens to me all the time. Um, and just to be respectful of everyone's time, I'm gonna put my timer on. I will be my own timekeeper um, for 20 minutes. Okay. Does the presentation look good? I don't, uh, this is my first time in my, yeah, looking good? Okay, good. Okay, so I played around with the title of the presentation and I came across a term in some of the articles that I read, uh, academic uh, performativity. And I think we all know as academics that there's a level of performance to what we do. And so that actually trickles down into the classroom. And so I will be talking about participation and attendance. My approach to the presentation was I wanted to uh, gather articles that were recently published. So I try to keep it like 2015 till now and, and take a look at what is being said in the field, what is being researched, et cetera. So let's go back to what we probably all do currently. Uh, and what is identifiable for us. So these are the traditional views with regards to, to participation and attendance. And this is not just theoretical. There are a few studies where they interviewed about 400 to 500 faculty in different fields. And they asked them, why do you grade participation? Why do you grade attendance? Give us the reason. I keep looking this way because that's where you all are at and I need the human contact. This is the only reason my face does this. I love to look at y'all's faces. So they interviewed these faculty members and they asked them, why do you grade participation and attendance if you do? And so these were the most common reasons. And we probably can all nod our heads and saying, yes, myself included. So a lot of faculty felt that participation was a marker of learning. So for them, if students are participating, that equals learning. The second reason was status quo. It was very interesting to me that some of the direct quotes from these surveys were, well, when I went to school, they graded my participation. So now I grade participation. Uh, when I was being trained in my graduate program to be an instructor, they told us to grade participation. So I grade participation. So there's a sense of continuing a tradition that hasn't yet been questioned or, or looked at differently. And last but not least, classroom management. This makes me think a lot about our teachers in K through 12, where you want certain behaviors. And so you don't want people to like be crazy. And so you want to manage your classroom. So participation with a list of you know, behaviors allows us to do that. A lot of the reasons for attendance are the same. Attendance for instructors are often linked to better grades. Status quo, again, that's the way it's always been done. I've never changed it, um, which gives me a little bit of anxiety to be honest, because one of the things I'm always afraid of is for my syllabi to be the same for several years in a row. I'm always concerned of forgetting to go back and like innovate my syllabus because it's more comfortable just to leave my syllabus the same and not go back to it. So status quo makes me anxious because it's something I'm always concerned about making sure that I'm not complacent. Uh, preparation for citizenship. So a lot of professors were saying, well, I need to, one of the missions of the university is to prepare students to be good citizens and good citizens have presence. 
Um, and so the quote that I have from one of the articles here is that while, you know, if you did a search, you certainly could find articles that say better attendance equals better grades, but there's also studies that counter this and that aren't necessarily convinced that better attendance is always going to equal better grades. So a little bit more about the origins. I want to go deeper into three of these categories. One of the things we need to realize and I need to realize as a recovering control maniac is instructors really like to have control of what's happening, right? And I, and again, I say, I'm not saying this as pointing, I'm saying like looking at myself in the mirror. So through grading attendance and participation, we have a great sense of control of the environment, right? And one of the quotes that really sort of, it, it was literally pedagogical therapy. It's the one that I have on top that says, a lot of research signals instructors need to gatekeep and or control student behavior to create the type of classroom they prefer, they as the instructor. So if I were to ask you to close your eyes and imagine your ideal classroom, you're standing at the front and you're making them laugh and they're all talking and there's never awkward silence and everyone's raising their hand. We have an imagined ideal classroom. Uh, and so we do everything in our policies and our syllabus to create that classroom, regardless of whatever is more beneficial or um, useful for our students, right? And again, I say this as a, as a, as a sinner myself. Um, again, learning. So this one was also, I'm telling you, there was a, reading all these articles is really a journey on self-reflection. Uh, instructors believe that students cannot learn as well on their own and are justifying their place in the academic setting. So by obligating students to come to class, our, one of the secondary arguments is you need me. You cannot learn what I'm teaching you without me. And it is scary for any of us to take the risk and realize perhaps we have a student who misses half of the semester and they still pass our class and they still learn what they needed to learn. Because then that's admitting to a certain extent, am I needed? Can, can they actually just go online and, and, and practice in another way or obtain input through another forum or produce output, it's scary. It's a very scary thing. And so part of the re research says that we have to let go of this fear of realizing that perhaps we're not needed because people can miss a ton of class and still do well with regards to exams and the, and the content of the course. Uh, mission, so again, the strictors believe we're, we're preparing future workers and future workers have good attendance, right? You can't miss going to work, so I'm preparing you for whenever you have a job that you're gonna have to be there, et cetera. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I have gone through every single model here. I'm sure all of you have gone through it. I've tortured myself with daily sheets of paper that I have to fill out, the student has to fill out, I have to collect, I have to remember to pass out the little sheet of paper, I have to remember to put the grade on the little sheet of paper in, in my grade book, et cetera. I think we've all gone through some sort of combination of these sample models of creating participation, whether it's from you, whether it's a grade from the student, or whether it is a um, combination, right, where there's a conversation. And then the last one I've never tried, which is there's not really a grade, but the professor will say, well, I think they were good participators, so I'm going to bump their final grade, which is the, the stickiest of them all because it's not very measurable, which leads me Sorry, I'm going a little fast. I'm, I'm gonna make sure I respect time. Uh, which leads me to two of the biggest issues with grading participation. The first one is measurability, right? And so instead of giving answers, I'm here just to give you questions so that you can have existential crisis about being an instructor. So you can thank me tonight as you drink wine and you ask yourself these questions. How much do you actually remember about who participated and how much they did? If I'm honest and if I'm, if I'm not performing perfect professor, I don't know. I really, and, and actually what I probably remember is the student who spoke the most. The students in the middle, right? The students who probably got an average participation. I just, there's just not, it's hard for me to sustain the idea that I can remember clearly out of 16 students, how each one participated and to be able to be nuanced enough to give each one an individual grade. Now, the next question comes from the CT workshop that we had uh, earlier in the semester. Is it fair to grade personality, right? And there's a lot of ideas related to this and with regards to, well, the only way you learn a language is if you speak it, but is the classroom the only place where you can speak it, which is a future 
future question. Um, what are you actually grading? Uh, to me, looking at the literature, we're, we're, we're grading behavior and it's actually we're grading performance and in a, in a performance in a theater sense. And I'll talk about that later. And does your personal bias have an effect on grading? I'm sure if I ask the group here, are there students that annoy you? No one, especially because we're being recorded, would raise their hand and say, yes, there's some students that annoy me or there's some students that I just don't have a good connection with. And that can lead into grading participation, even if we feel that we're very conscious of it and that we don't do that, we, we do. And I always tell my students, the moment that you think you don't have bias, that's the moment you need to actually ask yourself some questions because we all have bias, right? I mean, so then fairness. Are students just being rewarded for speaking often versus contributing thoughtfully? I know you all have been in a graduate course or at a conference where someone just talks all the time, but it's not really saying anything. I feel like that's academia for the most part, right? So just talking a lot doesn't mean you're contributing thoughtfully or actually doing something that's beneficial. Um, another point that really spoke to my heart is, will first-gen and minoritized students be punished for lack of experience? Performing in academia is a skill that you need to learn and have exposure to. How do you behave in college? How do you approach a professor? How do you intervene in a discussion? I still get nervous when I raise my hand um, to make a comment at a conference. Like I get sweat, my palms get sweaty. I wanna make sure that I speak well, that like no one else already asked my question. And so maybe this is some of the things that are happening to our students that are first-gen or minoritized. They just don't know how to behave in an academic setting because this is their first time, especially at Rice, which is private, highly competitive, and, and, and very new to some of our first-gen students. And if a student is acquiring speaking skills outside of the classroom, is this counted? Meaning, I know we like to think that the holy grail of speaking and input and output is the 50 minutes that we see the students, but it's not, right? This is why all of us do speaking activities outside of class, right? So we don't need to be so hardcore about the only space that matters where output is produced is in the classroom, right? And so what the literature is asking us, the current literature that I was able to look at is asking us to ask critical questions about these traditions that we've sort of just been following along, right? With not much thought, especially because most of us are focused on thinking about what we consider the more important things, which is pedagogy, et cetera. This quote that I have in the middle really spoke to me. Many instructors, um, we interpret that student silence or purposeful non-participation also stems from lack of preparation, motivation, or disinterest, and I'm guilty of that. Well, they're not speaking because they didn't do the homework, or they're just not at the level of everyone else. And I've, I've made those assumptions, and those are not necessarily true, and you'll see some of the things that students actually say about participation. Students feel that they're just performing to please us. So they're not worried about, am I learning how to conjugate or am I learning how to say a question correctly or is my accent improving? I'm just performing so that the instructor gives me a good grade. And these are students that were interviewed for this study. There's one study where faculty are interviewed and then they compare the responses from faculty to students. And this is what the students say. There's concerns about being corrected after speaking. I know that a lot of us say, well, I do it really nicely, or I do it indirectly. And, and Kate can talk a lot about correction. She actually gave us a workshop on that. Um, we can say it in the most high-pitched, kind, soft voice, indirectly, you know, the, the, the old trick of like, I mirror it back corrected. I don't tell them that they're incorrect. I mirror it back. Students know what we're doing, and there's still an anxiety about being corrected. Not to say that we need to stop correcting, but we need to know what's going on in the mind of our students. Again, they're aware of the influence of their background in preparation for an academic context, right? So if I'm first gen, and then I see a student who's, you know, next gen, right, that they're a generation of you come from a generation of families who've gone to college and they see them so comfortable speaking that that can be uncomfortable for students who, who aren't as comfortable. Lack of clarity about expectations. It was interesting that a lot of the students who were interviewed had a class that had clear participation guidelines, right? We're still confused. We're still not sure what the professor wants out of them for participation. Students are also concerned with bias, right? So am I liked by the professor or not? A lot of us are very um, focused on not having favorites, but we still end up having favorites. You, you know this, right? You know that there's the one student who like 
you see outside of class for coffee or you write a letter for students perceive that and they understand. And so participation is often connected to bias. Lack of autonomy. This one, I feel like I keep saying this about everything. This one really impacted me. So I'm just going to say the whole research impacted me. So lack of autonomy. Students feel that we are infantilizing them and not treating them as adults. Um, and so I don't have much more to say. I am very serious about making sure my students enjoy learning the language, but that I don't infantilize them and treat the class like I'm in kindergarten, right? So like put your hands down and don't speak now and sit there and go. I work very hard to treat them as adults. And that's hard because I mean, the older I get, the, the, the younger they seem, right? Like they seem like even more like babies. Um, and so they really wanna be treated like adults and to be given the freedom to um, make choices with regards to attendance and participation, more so with um, attendance, right? They feel that they have lives outside of school and that they would like the autonomy, autonomy to make decisions about coming to class or not. And the shocking number eight, the most common reason for absence in one study was poor teaching, which I was like, no, it's their fault that they're absent because they're not committed or they're, you know, like, I feel like if we were to give reasons why kids, uh, students don't come to class, we would probably name a bunch of things and not name ourselves. And it's a hard pill to swallow, but that was one of the mentioned reasons in this study of, I think it was around 700 students that were interviewed. So the few last things that I wanna talk about is this word performativity, performance. Um, students are just wondering what and how does my professor want me to perform so I can get a good grade for participation. So what do you need me to do? You need me to raise my hand five times? I'll raise my hand five times. You need me to spit out the answer? I'll spit out the answer. Um, and this is problematic because we want quality conversation to happen in class, whether it's when they're learning the language, right? Um, or whether it's when they're a higher level and they're having to talk about deeper things. And so one of the things that has happened in academia is this idea of learnerism, which means that the process of learning has now been turned into a public performance, right? Um, where it used to be a private activity, right? I would be in the library, I would read, I would, you know, process the information and more and more because we have turned to, you know, community building, um, communities of knowledge, working, you know, we do a lot of group work and, and it's a good thing, right? Of us exchanging ideas and having conversations with the grading of participation, there's a little bit of like, I need to show that I'm learning publicly to others, and then I get a grade. Um, and the other thing that concerns us, McFarland actually is very theoretical. And so what they're doing is just giving us these questions and these concerns about what is happening. So McFarland says that attendance requirements are also to some extent symptomatic of a crisis of confidence. Uh, about the value of higher education, right? So we're with the same thing about us, right? Justifying that they need to come see us. So we want to demonstrate that there's value by convincing folks that you have to be here every day uh, because if not, the experience is not complete and you won't learn as much. So the questions that I had is, if many instructors do not like teaching to the test, right? We all know that our K-12 colleagues are always under this pressure of teaching to the test and don't have these freedoms. Do we not, to a certain extent, do the same thing because I'm speaking to the grade as a student, right? I'm not speaking to practice. I'm not speaking to get better. I'm speaking to get a check from my professor, which is literally something I used to do. I, now that I think about it, I don't know how I did it. I used to have the, the list of my students, and I would put a check mark every time somebody would talk. And then I would count all those check marks at the end. And it would be like a competition. Whoever had the most check marks would get the best grade and then consistently down. And now I wonder, was the person with the most check marks actually doing something good? Were they actually contributing to class? Um, and then again, the, the question that I repeated earlier, um, is the classroom the only space to use the target language? Of course it's not, right? It's one space of many spaces that we should be trying to um, create for students to speak. And so if anything, I would really recommend taking a look at the McFarland articles. Uh, there's two of them that really talk about how there's just a lot of performing going on versus actual learning and genuine engagement with the material that we're looking at in, in a class. 
So here are some ideas. I'm not just going to leave you with ex existential questions so that you can cry about our field. Uh, there's some ideas here uh, from the reading. Uh, nonverbal participation could be included. If you're still going to grade participation, we could include nonverbal participation, engagement in discussion boards. Um, you know, there's, uh, I know that one colleague that used to be here did a whole texting um, a project with the students. So thinking about expanding what participation means. Uh, dynamic pairing, uh, meaning, and there's a typo, uh, meaning that uh, some students might not feel comfortable contributing to the big class discussion, but actually might flourish and have a great time doing it in a smaller two-person group. And that's okay, right? If the point is for the student to be engaged, um, why do we privilege being able to talk in front of 16 people if they're actually able to do that in a smaller group. Participation outside of class is valuable, right? Um, I'm going to show you an example of a social contract. I do have time versus a stringent policy. Um, be aware of students' level. So you need to give enough time for first year students to prepare a response to contribute, much more time to them than you need third year students to give time, but you still should give them time. Because if we get nervous speaking in public, they get nervous speaking in public. So make sure we embed enough time for them to prepare the thing that they're going to say. I know that we all want them to be able to contribute spontaneously. That's sort of the highest level, but work that slowly in. It's not easy to respond to questions spontaneously in our first language. It's not easy in the second language. Um, and then, you know, self-reflection about traditions. We need, to, we need to continue to question these things that we haven't changed since the 90s or 80s. So what I did is I took the leap. I removed participation and attendance before the pandemic. I was just crazy. Um, there was a little bit of a correlation between higher grades and attendance, but attendance was not affected in my small sample of a couple of semesters. Uh, what was great, and my time has stopped, what was great is that students still sent justifications for missing class. And I had to keep reminding them, like, I, no, I don't grade attend. No, but I feel so bad. I want you to know why I'm not there. So it just really, I, to show them that you have confidence in them is such a great, has such a great outcome. Participation in my case was not significantly affected. Again, I had my first year class canceled when I started this, so I haven't been able to implement this in first year, so it might yield to different results because I was doing a higher level. Again, I built in more preparation before I asked them to speak. A lot more breakout room work so that they can prepare. Um, and here is a social contract, which is the last thing I will show you. So this is literally what I put on my syllabus to explain to them why I don't have participation. I talk about them being adults. I talk about them um, being involved in how um, engaging the class is going to be. I tell them I'm going to come in pumped and excited and bring in interesting things. But the other half of the social contract is you have to do the same um, and participation the same, right? I, I try to use this language about I trust you, you're an adult, and we're building this together. Again, I only have about four semesters of experience that I haven't really quantified like the articles do, but a lot of the articles support this. And I look forward to be able to implement this in first year. These are the references. They're very accessible. They're very, you can read them rather quickly, especially because the empirical ones, I skip all the methods and, the, and I just go right to the discussion and the results. Tell me what the numbers told you. So the empirical articles are very easy to, to grasp and read. They have a lot of interesting information. Um, I'm maybe like 30 seconds over, but sorry if I was speeding. Um, but I hope that some of these questions that the research and, and the literature um, are asking us to ask ourselves really um, motivate us to, to rethink what we're doing with attendance and participation. So hopefully some of this was interesting to you. Thank you for listening to me. I decided to talk about this topic because one of, I mean, beside the fact that we have all wanting always to engage our uh, students, and now more than ever, I have been, uh, since I also teach online at Lone Star, they have started, I mean, they have been doing it for a while, I guess, but they have started offering um, uh, an online course for faculty that is called Elite Track 1 to 3, 
And um, I signed up actually for all of them. And then I later realized that I've been too brave to do that because people were like, you signed up for all of them at once? I'm like, yeah, I know. So the first one was on engagement. And I was very curious to learn more about uh, what my other colleagues are doing in different fields. And it was amazing. I didn't have time to really do all the homework, but it was set up in a five-week course where we would meet once a week and then there were as readings and then activities. Very, very well designed. And maybe at the end, if I have time, I will show you a little bit. So <clears throat> I started thinking about all this because especially since last spring that we switched to online learning and to distance learning, I realized that I thought that engaging my students in class was hard in person. I mean, now it's like harder than ever. I'm like, I do not know what to do with you. Nobody's answering, nobody's saying anything. I don't know if they hear me or not. It's just been so difficult. So I can't engage them. They seem to be very passive. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, they don't interact much. Even when I tell them, hey, start working in your groups, they're just sitting them quietly on their computer. I'm like, in your groups, they're still sitting there. <laughs> and then um, I heard also from many of them how it's been hard for them to be so much behind the screen, which I understand. Um, but I also, when I was also reading about uh, in this amazing book that actually I would recommend to everyone and I will share the reference later, one of the books that at Lone Star, they uh, send us the reference and they said it's a great book for especially the online learner. It's engaging the online learner. Um, that they are explaining in it on how we have been, most, most of the classes are based on lectures and how students are just used to sit there and being passive. And now we are asking them to do something different. So I started thinking because I wanted my students to do more than the three times 55 minutes that they come to class. It was already not enough. I wanted them to be able to engage outside of the class. So in my 263, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to try to see, I have the, Okay, I was able, I think, to minimize it. Um, in my 263 course that was last semester, here is a list of engagement activities that I had for my students. And I wanted to show you a little bit that where I started, I wanted them to go to four sessions of what we have here in Houston as a French Houston meetup group, which is a French uh, community that meets here. Um, this, they were offering those sessions twice a week. I only asked my students to go there for 30 minutes each time. And then they had to reflect on their session and write, a, I would guide them with specific questions so they can actually really think about their experience. And they also had to go to four sessions of something that I would offer called Parlons Francais, where I would just talk about, I would bring up different topics and then we would just have conversations. And that was offered once a week uh, for about 30 to 40 minutes. And again, they had to write a reflection on it. <clears throat> um, but as you can see, I made them go to all, so eight sessions total, which in my mind, I was like, okay, so it's two hours of this total and two hours of the other one. So I'm not asking them for that much for the whole semester. But I never thought about, do I need to give them choices or not? Is it too much? Well, how it is? That's where I really started. Then I started thinking, okay, I really want them to have a better experience and I want to know how, we, how these sessions are going. So towards the end of the semester, I decided to gather feedback. I wanted to reflect back. And uh, I, I knew that I wanted to make those changes. If there were any changes needed, I wanted to see where the students are and what kind of changes uh, are needed. I also started reading a lot about best practices and also following that course on engagement, I was just doing a lot of activities on figuring out what is really engagement, what can we expect from students, especially now that we are mostly online. Um, that just applied very well to what we were doing also here at Rice. So I sent a survey to my, uh, to my students. And I asked them very specific questions. I asked them questions about the Houston meetup group. And I asked them, if you had a choice, would you keep those sessions? And if you were keeping them, uh, how many of them, um, to how many of them would you go to? So for example, I gave them options. Would you go, do you think we need two of them, three of them, four of them, um, to kind of see where they are. And here is the results that I, here are the results that I gathered. So as you can see on the, Left, I mean, on the left side of my screen, I, those are the positive feedback. So they said, I really like going. I feel I learned something each time. 
Uh, I feel like it was one of more, my more authentic French speaking experiences last semester. It was nice to improve my conversational skills. So those were all very nice to hear that. I was like, oh, great. So I did a great job by sending them there. Then I started reading some other comments, which I can say that it's always hard to read that your students are not doing well uh, because of a choice that you made. And I was like, oh, OK, the topic spoken while interesting were at a level too advanced for my level of French. While I was impressed that I knew in general what was being spoken, I felt like I couldn't really contribute. So I was like, oh, that was really not my intention there. And then I feel like it was good practice. Um, to talk to people who knew French really well, but it was also a little overwhelming. They're super friendly, but <laughs> I think it's a super hard to catch up with some conversation. So then I started thinking, okay, so that was the result for the Houston Meetup Group. And I kind of felt bad because I was like, I actually put my students in a position where they had to go to something and they were forced to go to something that they felt uncomfortable. Obviously, my uh, intentions were to really push them um in a in an environment that they were I, I felt that they're going to be comfortable but again I was thinking about how I would be comfortable going to any of these events and I don't know how I was expecting my students who many of them are too shy to even speak in class <laughs> to go to one of these events with people that they don't know and actually engage in a conversation so that was for the meetup group then I also received the feedback for the Parlons Francais sessions. And again, that was the same thing. I liked the time we baked the cake together over Zoom during the summer. That was one of the most practical applications. So that went very well. I offered one of those sessions of cooking and it was so much fun. Uh, I felt much more comfortable in these sessions with only my classmates and the instructor. So, so those are the students who certainly felt bad going to the other meetings and it was less intimidating. So that also made sense. Then on the other hand, as I was being very excited that, oh, these are working, those are great. Then I read, <laughs> I think it would be nice to get together without an instructor and speak casually. And I was like, oh, okay then. And then I felt that the Parlons Francais were too structured. I felt like just an additional class. But then the person said, I would love to do like, the Houston meetup group with maybe instructor presence, but no instructor involvement. And I really, really appreciated that feedback. So what I did from there was that in addition to all my readings, one of the readings really caught my attention. And that was the one focused on the importance of student-centered syllabus. So that was one of the really main readings that we had to do. And that started make me, I started thinking, I was like, okay, what is exactly a student-centered syllabus? And that's when it really hit me. I realized that I never involve my students. I never ask them anything. I never really ask, I never make my syllabus based on what my students really say. So when I read in that article that, alert, so basically a nurse to the syllabus, it means that we can allow the students to have a say in policies, in some at least policies and procedures, and uh, depending on the course and the student's path allows some flexibility in decision making and assignment weights. So I thought, okay, this is not like exams or it's a high stake thing, or it's not like there may be uh, assignment, but this is more like an area where why not? They should have a say in it. Um, and I also thought that, um, <clears throat> sorry, just trying to gather my thoughts. Um, that it would be, oh, and then part of the article was also explaining that when students are involved in that process, they are also more engaged. If you allow them to think about it, if you allow them to voice their concerns or tell you what they would like or what they do not like, they will also be more engaged eventually. So then I thought, okay, that would be a great area to try it out. I really want, I heard them, I heard them that sometimes it's working for them, some activities are not. So number one, I started calling my activities engagement activities. So I, was, I, I created on my, basically right now on my um, grading, I have one category that is engagement activities. And in that category, many things are fitting in there. So what I told my students was that I'm gonna start giving you choices. I do not wanna force you to go to something that you really, because at the end, my objective is for you to learn not to be uncomfortable, to be intimidated. I really want you to feel comfortable. So 
I told them that here are the three different options that you have. We do have the French Houston Meetup Group. We have the Parlons Francais sessions. And then in addition to that, since I had a great uh, volunteer in the community who wanted to help me, I also set up uh, four sessions on four Sundays with her. And that was also based on the time that my students were available. So in order to decide when is the best time to meet, I did another survey and asked the students which day of the week and what time, and we kind of worked together. So she's offering the sessions four times, twice she's doing it at 4 p.m. on Sundays, and twice she's doing it at 8.30 in the morning on two Sundays, mostly to also accommodate the students or international students and abroad. So they are in a different time zone. So I try to be very careful about not excluding anyone and make it as accessible as possible to everyone. And then I told my students and my syllabus that you are only required to go to four meetings. So you're gonna choose. You can go actually to four meetings with Joanna, or you can go to four Houston Meetup Group, or you can, we can mix and match them. At the end, I want you to try and to decide what works for you, because I'm sure that if you make a decision based on that, you will actually get something out of it. So the students were actually pretty excited about having that option. And from there, I started making also another decision based on that last uh, comment that I received on my survey. So the students said it would be nice if the instructor was there, but then she was not interfering. So she was just there. But then I thought, okay, I cannot just be there and have the students just sit there because then what's going to happen is that we are going to have a session where everybody is looking at each other on Zoom and I cannot say anything anymore because I'm not supposed to. So then I didn't know how to do that. So then I thought, okay, we're going to do something else. I'm going to make them leaders since many of them are good leaders. How about we do that? So I told myself, okay, we are going to be offering three sessions of Parlons Francais. And I told them I'm going to send out a survey at the beginning of the semester. So I did a lot of surveys this semester, as you can tell. <laughs> and I told them that, um, so what I want is that if you are interested in these sessions, number one, let me know if you would like to participate. But beyond that, let me know if you would be interested in leading the session with another student where you're going to be fully in charge. And then I asked them about some times and days to see when is the most convenient time to offer them. Uh, when I did that, it was very interesting because in my mind, I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to get at the most five students who are going to just say, oh, we, we can, we want to do that. But it was very nice because I have about, I'm going to have to go back and count, but I think I ended up with a good 12 volunteers, I think, who wanted to lead. And I was super excited. So I was like, okay, then maybe we can have six sessions since we do have all these volunteers. And then everybody said that we are available on Sundays after, I can't remember, five or six or at seven. So yeah, that's the only unfortunate part. So now I am, this Sunday, for example, <laughs> I'm going to start working at 8.30 in the morning. And last week I had to do this session at seven on a Sunday. So yes, that's, that part was a little bit tricky, but I didn't mind. And I started uh, organizing them. I started uh, making sure that they're good. They're alternating with Joanna's session. So I did one Parlons Francais, maybe one break they take off, then another session with Joanna. Then we come back to the Parlons Francais. This way they are not all back to back. And um, what I also did was that before each session, before each pair had to present, I send them an email and I say, I would like to meet with you to talk about the session and see if you have any questions. So, so far we have done two of them and that was very nice because the fact that I was able to meet with them, it helped them really bring up a lot of many questions and ask me, um, okay, uh, we want to present that. What do you think? Or we want to do this. What do you think? So we were really able to work together and I started telling them what to keep in mind that we want the students to get engaged. So whatever activities they have in mind, it's not presentation. It's whatever they think it's going to be interesting and fun way to get their peers engaged in those activities. Um, and then at the same time, I told them to have backup activities to make sure that, okay, if we know we are, we finish in 20 minutes, you know how sometimes you have an activity and not that many students, you know, they say anything and then suddenly, oh, I have an extra 10 minutes. What am I going to do now? So I gave them a lot of tools and they were very grateful for that. They said that we, they learned so much by just doing that with me. And what was the most amazing part for me was that 
in both sessions. So usually when I have done the Parlons Francais, maybe I don't know, five or six students would show up. This past Sunday, I had about 20 participants. And that was amazing. Just the fact that all of these kids came to support their peers or they came because they thought it's fun or whatever that was, it was just really, really nice. So I had great success with those. I had a high number of participants and they were very engaging sessions. And as I read in one of the articles, it's true that letting students teach is scary, but I think it's a great way for them to learn because in my past session, the students, they brought many activities, really fun activities. And one of them when they worked on French idioms. So they brought 12 idioms and I helped them a little bit and to figure out with the students, what do they mean? Is there an equivalent in English? So by just doing that research, I know that the students already learned so much by just, at least the students who presented, they already learned a lot. And I also had the same experience with Joanna's session when uh, she, she uh, prepared, uh, she worked on the French cliche about two weeks ago. The session went so amazingly well that the students that wanted to present after her, they said, we wanna follow her format. That was so great. It was so nice that, and everybody was so engaged, even though they didn't know her, but the fact that she just figured how as a young person also to get them involved, it was just really, really, I mean, for me, it was really successful. And I'm really, really happy that I got a chance to, to do the survey, to ask them to reflect on it and to make changes based on what they told me. Um, so the two things that I've learned so far is that in the future, personally, I would always ask my students in certain areas that is not high stake, what do you think? How would you like it to be? Or what would be the weight? And then I would also make sure that I allow them to be leaders, uh, especially in those levels that, you know, they do have the language skills to do that. So that would be for the most part what I have. And I'm just going to uh, stop here so we have enough time for questions. Thank you very much for listening.